Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. It's episode number 60. We have a question from Phil. I just wanted to ask about your relationship with Mark Twain. How did you guys first meet? And maybe what's one or two things you've learned from him and one or two things you've helped pass along to inform his training programs. You both are very interesting guys, and I would just love to learn a little bit more about that backstory. Yeah, it's a very simple story. Uh, I was here in Salt Lake City in beautiful Murray, and uh, Mark was just to the north of us, uh, about, about 10 miles in a place called Jim Jones. G-Y-M Jones. It's a play off of the, uh, the terrible tragedy that I grew up with uh, when my congressman, Congressman uh, Leo J. Ryan, was murdered by a cult. Uh, times change. Uh, we were introduced by someone online. It was got one of those Mark Dan, Dan Mark things because we I'd heard of him and he'd heard of me. We just didn't know we were this close. And Mark first came over a few times to train with me in the backyard. Uh, many of the photos that you see of me that are kind of the most famous, like the cover of Never Let Go, that's Mark Dwight who took the picture. Uh, I was developing, and I, by the time I met Mark, I was fairly deep into my understanding of loaded carries. So uh, with Mark, we were doing things like rock runs. They said, when you pick up a heavy rock and run with it, uh, we've softened up a little bit and now use sandbags. Uh, we were doing combination movements at the time, like uh, bear hug and, uh, and sled pull, which is at the cover of Never Let Go. Uh, I was working on and developed pretty fully by the time I met Mark the whole lift and run series. That's where you do like a, a squat followed immediately by a sprint, immediately. And that can be an overhead squat, that works well. Front squat works well. Any kettlebell variation works well. Uh, I like short, hard sprints the best, but you can also do the lift and sleds, which is the, a squat or a hinge again. I should have said squat or hinge in the beginning. Followed by a sled pull, and the only thing on that, you be careful, just make sure the, the weight isn't in the way of the sled as it comes. Uh, we've gone so far since then. Uh, Mark would come over, and while we were training certain special forces guys in my backyard, we would have a uh, we would have people uh, on my deck uh, cooking all kinds of different meats and stuff. And so basically, we'd work out hard for a couple hours, and then uh, drink beer and eat meat on my deck. Um, Mark and I later worked with a group of American military uh, who sadly all died uh, in, a, in a terrible uh, incident uh, about a decade ago. And it was sad because uh, several of them had, I had become very close with. Um, I don't see Mark as much as I used to. Uh, once, well, you know, uh, you might know this, is that he did the, the training for the guys in 300. And I got to tell you, as much as I love Mark, that 300 movie, maybe the way it was sold, did a lot of damage for the way we coach people uh, because everyone wanted to have those. They wanted to look like one of the guys in the movies. And that's great. And Mark did a great job setting them up. The problem was the damage control downstream because, uh, you know, you'd want to train, you know, get ready for American football or discus throwing. The guys wanted to have, you know, eight pack abs and, you know, go, ooh, a lot. And that just doesn't always help. Um, the interesting thing, my favorite thing about Mark is that Mark's first strength coach was Steve Ilg. And I do have a, a, I have a review of some of Steve Ilg's uh, book uh, here on, on the YouTube channel. And I'm a big fan of Steve Ilg and his holistic fitness approach. Um, Mark one time told me he wished he would have appreciated some of the things that S Steve had been coaching him, things like meditation and stuff. Uh, this isn't a knock on anybody. This is certainly not a knock on Mark, but what happens when you're first coming up is the tools of recovery, including meditation and sleep and nap, you know, you ignore it. And then all of a sudden you overdo all that stuff. And then when you get to the ripe old age of 63, you kind of figure out, you know, you finally figure out the role of each. Uh, I would say, of course, uh, the best on that was always Charlie Francis, the great uh, Canadian sprint coach. Uh, one or two things uh, I learned from Mark. Um, well, uh, Mark was the first person to really expound on something that I had read as a child. In fact, I read it for cl clearly when I was in the ninth grade because some of my first workouts were based on Pat O'Shea, the great Oregon State, not only was a weightlifter, but he was a great uh, scientist. 
and it was interval weight training. So that's the thing I got from Mark the best. Now you can say, you can raise your hand and say, well, isn't that, isn't that circuit training? I'll go, okay, yeah, it's circuit training. Isn't that this or that? Yes, it's this or that. But the clarity was something I never fully uh, grasped. So yeah, so clarifying the work of Pat O'Shea would be big. Uh, interval weight training would be very big because I can use that in my in, with the people I work with. Boy, I hope uh, Mark learned some things from me. One of the best things I think Mark and his groups back then learned is what strong is, and that was an issue. Uh, whenever you have a group training, uh, you get uh, you know you get an isolated group training. Certain things become the norm very often. Uh, like for men, it might be ooh a three hundred pound deadlift. Well, you know I doubled that and change more. And so uh, many of my articles, you'll find I had a great conversation with Mark about there's you know there's max 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 and max 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 you know and um, my best lifts and best throws. Um, these aren't you know none of those are done in in the happy confines of the gym. They're all on the platform make or die lifts and. Uh, so that's going to be a totally different experience for somebody who's come in from another sport like cycling or something like that who begins to lift weights. They might think that a 300 or even a 400 pound deadlift is a lot. Whereas, you know, once you've seen literally hundreds of high school 15, 16, 17 year old boys deadlift 400, you can't really go, oh my God, it's the biggest lift of all time. Uh, I hope none of what I said was negative at all because I have great respect for Mark. Um, I'd love for you to ask him the same question. It'd be fun to hear. So yeah, so one of the things I think I taught him was the difference between max and max and max, 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 and all that. And I also think uh, I, I might have been able to teach him how more, many more things you can get out of strength training than just strength. So, you know, Philip, this was a, this was a good question. It got me thinking a little bit. And, I, and as I always joke, I think thinking is a good thing. So thank you very much. We have a question from Killov. I have a 20 kilo kettlebell. Well, good for you. I can do 100 one arm swings in 10 minutes, followed by 10 Turkish get ups in 10 minutes. I know you don't like loading this exercise, but I just wanted to throw it anyway so you know my strength level. Okay? I can do multiple sets of seven to eight snatches, isn't that interesting? And multiple sets of five or six presses with the bell. I weigh 72K and I'm 176 centimeters tall. That tall. My question is what target should I aim for to exhaust all the uses of this bell? I know I should probably be able to do 100 swings in five minutes, but are there any other goals you would recommend? Yeah, how can you, I, I don't understand. I, I know that there's a whole system of kettlebellers who believes this is a, a, a good program. I just don't see what the big deal in doing 100 swings in a certain amount of time is. Uh, I'd much rather see you do 100 snatches with that in five minutes. Um, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, okay, I, I gotta be care, careful here because I am the 10,000 swing challenge guy and. And I love swings. I think swings have great value. In fact, I think they're undervalued even by people who think they have great value. But for me, I would rather you go in the direction of doing the, the standard RKC snatch test. 100 snatches in five minutes with the bell. I mean, I think that's a really good standard for you. Uh, if you're on the site, go to the RKC prep program and look at some of the ideas. You won't be able to do them all because you only have one bell. Uh, in the world of presses, why don't you uh, start to change your presses? So you, you're, you're doing kettlebell presses with the bell here. You might want to do some where you, uh, where you hold just the, the bell part so the handle will be up here and do some presses that way. By the way, I found that's actually a nice curative for people who are struggling with like elbow or shoulder issues because you have to be so much uh, better as you press it. And then of course, if you want, you can move to the bottoms up press. I'm holding the handle here and then the bell is up here and the horns are holding it. And that takes a lot. A lot more tension and control. You can drop to kneeling on the ground with both knees. You can go to half kneeling. You can do that exercise where you're half kneeling but you spread the legs out like you're coming up at a Turkish getup. You could also uh, go on my Instagram channel and look up the uh, I do a Turkish get down press series. So vertical we do one press. When you get in that cross-country ski position one press. Bring the knee to the ground half kneeling one press. When you swivel the leg, one press. As you go down, one press, one press, one press. And then one from the bottom. Grab with both hands and finish. Those are just a couple of options. Uh, I honestly think you could probably have a really good life with just a 20 kilo bell for men and the 10 for, for most women.
uh, you, I would say start to play around with some ideas. Um, what I said is nothing new under the sun. I'd also like you to see to try some of these workouts I recommend like up to. It'd be fun to see you do up to 50 presses each hand in a workout sometime. And just so if you do six reps, then you do another five, now you're at 11, and you're to build yourself up to 50, 100 reps, okay? Um, let me know how it goes. Thank you. We have a question from Patrick. At what point should someone quit buying heavier kettlebells and move on to basic barbell lifts? You know, I'm going to stop right there. I still love, Patrick, the original three choices. You could get the 16, the 24, and the 32. If we could magically go back in time and never make any of the other bells, I would be a much happier person because I wouldn't have to spend so much time dealing with this issue. In my gym, we have an 18 kilo bell, 18 kilos, because the 16 was too light, the 24 too heavy, the 20 was too light, so we got an 18. You know, you start to run into these numbers. The 22 kilo bell, who needed that? Um, so, I regress. Uh, during the pandemic, during the pandemic, my wife and I quit our gym membership and have slowly been building our kettlebell and dumbbell collection. Currently, my heaviest bells are a 32 and 228k bells. I compress the single bell and double bells eight times. Oh, you're, that's not bad. I am wondering if breaking down and buying a barbell and some bumper plates would be a wiser choice than buying heavier bells. Uh, Patrick, let me just give you my little magical thing that I tell people. So, and I've mentioned this before, um, if you're a male and you've never done kettlebells, you buy a 20. If you're female and you've never done kettlebells, you buy a 10. After, as a male, you get you use that 20 for a while, uh, buy a 20, 24. Now, I know it's against, again, what I just said about only having three, but the 20 is magical. Once you get a 24, after a while, you start, like you notice, you start to, it gets too light. I like where you had it went next, you got the the 28s and then from there the 32 the direction I tell people to go after that is doubles so in a perfect in a perfect gym for you Patrick at the strength levels I'm guessing double 20s double 24s double 28s double 32s uh, if you know and the nice thing is if you're buying bells for your wife too uh, 10s 12s 16s and man you guys have everything you need in the world of kettlebells Going heavier in the bells isn't isn't worth the time and money. You're not going to use them. Uh, I have double 36s and I have a, a 48. Sure, we use them, but uh, for for most kettlebell exercises, you're, they're, they're, they're not used very much. And you have to be fairly strong to play with them. Um, an inexpensive barbell and bumper plates would, yes, that would be a definite yes for me. I'd love to have had this question kind of back in time a little bit. Uh, I would love to have seen you get the 16, 24, 28, just singles, and then pick up a barbell then, and then fill in your collection uh, to get the doubles up. Uh, with a, a barbell, a suspension trainer, barbell suspension trainer, that mix of kettlebells, you know, you might, a pull-up station, an uh, uh, ab wheel, you know, five bucks, um, you're going to be set for life. So I like where your head's at. Um, you got to make that financial decision yourself, but I've never seen the value of buying heavier bells. So how do I end up with heavier bells? Uh, we have a place over here that, you know, it's one of those places you can buy stuff. Uh, you know, we you know, fall off the back of the truck, you know, kind of places. And I got a call one day from my brother-in-law. He said, there's a bunch of really nice kettlebells here. So I got, in, I got my car, drove out there, and, uh, well, one time I bought two 24s, and a and a 36 for a total of sixty dollars which of course i think the shipping for a 24 is about that much so uh kind of keep your eyes open you might be able to get some real good deals okay uh one thing i did learn don't go cheap on a barbell uh certainly not, you don't need the one that they're using on the olympic you know platform but a good barbell is worth the money don't worry too much about spending a lot of money on bumper plates uh, I have the ones called Hamptons, and they're just fine. They're metal with just rubber rims for home use. Now, they would fall apart in a, in a normal gym setting, uh, in a collegiate weight room, uh, and on the platform. But for home use, they're pretty good. I hope that helps. Thank you very much.
We got a question from Lisa, and I believe I know Lisa. I'm a 61-year-old woman with a total hip replacement aiming to improve power and mobility for martial arts. I have completed my second round of easy strength Olympic lifting in my mission to learn the Olympic lifts at home. Uh, that's, I mean, it's, it, Lisa, you, know, you inspire because here you are, 61, total hip, learning the Olympic lifts at home, and I get hundreds of emails a year. Dan, you know, what should I do to learn the Olympic lifts? And I always tell the people, do them, and here is you doing them. So hats off first before we get started. I really enjoyed this program and I'm about to start my third round. Good for you. I do power versions of cleans and snatches with my blessing. And I also have been using a push press rather than a jerk in the clean and jerk. For this round, I was thinking of trying the jerk, but just wanted to check in with what its benefits are compared to the, uh, the other two presses for someone who's likely never to complete, compete. I assume the jerk means more impact on the hip joint than the push press. I, I, I don't know. So I'm weighing up risk versus benefit on my hip of learning this technique. Honestly, if you're doing power cleans and power snatches, I, I think your hip is good. Also, do people stick with one stance for the jerk or swap which leg is forward and which is back? I gotta tell you, I learned a funny thing years ago. Uh, I wish I could do this for you, Lisa. Uh, you walk, when someone says, I don't know which foot the jerk uh, put forward, you walk up behind them when they're not expecting it and you push them. And whatever foot goes out to stop is your jerk stance. And it's funny to say that because it's, I mean, I hate to say 100 because nothing's ever 100%, but it's really close to being a foolproof thing. So for me, uh, what I've discovered is most right-handers go left foot first. Uh, when you kick with your right foot, you put your left foot out. When you throw with your right hand, you put your left foot forward uh, as, as, the, as the brace. <sighs> Is there going to be more damage by jerking? I don't think so. You might want to sit down with a good orthopedic before, you know, just to ask if it's really a concern. The two terms I use when people jerk overhead are dip, stomp. I want you to jerk with your ears. I want to hear that front foot really make contact. Uh, what's interesting, if you focus on making a lot of noise with that front foot, magically, uh, you tend to jerk correctly. When I teach the kettlebell certs, it's, I, I tell people, with ballistics, you don't lift with your eyes, you lift with your ears. You want to hear that noise, even in the push jerk. I, I want to go dip, stomp, boom, or slap, I guess the term I use, dip, slap. And in the, in the jerk, dip, stomp. Um, yeah, I, I mean, try it. Uh, try it for a few one, two, three workouts. If you like it, keep doing it. Uh, be sure, I know Lisa, you're on the forum. Uh, be sure to go to my notes in From the Ground Up and try some of the ideas that uh, I shared with, that Dick Notmeyer shared with me. And uh, you know I'm, I'm always here for you, Lisa, to answer any question from you. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Garrett. Garrett asks, I'm a high school PE teacher. <laughs> Hats off to you, my friend. <laughs> Uh, we are headed back to school, but from a distance. I am struggling as to how I should create a meaningful program that they will enjoy, be challenged by, with virtually no equipment. Plus, I am from Minnesota, so weather is a factor. I am open to any suggestions or recommendations you may have for me. Oh, brother, I mean, come on. Uh, okay. Uh, I would suggest... Uh, Getting everybody in a circle and doing general calisthenics with you in the middle, or you uh, personally, I like to be part of the circle so I could see everybody. Uh, run them through the basics of calisthenics. Uh, uh, you, you can easily have the six foot difference. I'm guessing that'll work. It works up to about 40 kids. Uh, that that'll work up to about 40. If it's bigger than that, you might have to make two concentric circles. Be on the outside circle. Um, you could certainly do original strength. Uh, go see the notes in uh, on the download section at Dan John University from Tim Anderson. That's what we did. We did uh, original strength. Uh, we did uh, a whole variety of push-ups, uh, a whole variety of uh, the whole dead bug and sit-up family and all that stuff. Um, you can make it work. You can make it work. Um, as for, you know, traditionally there's three pillars of physical education. Uh, 
the first one is the military and so if you do have something like an obstacle course or a par course or you can even just invent yours get those you know those great tables that you have at schools you know that's the it's the the, the, the table like this with the two sets of uh, built-in chairs you could have your kids uh, you know parkour over that you could have them run around barrels you could have you could just make up a fun little course and in fact get feedback from the kids if they want to make something tougher or easier um, I would like you to look up the word parkour p-a-r-c-o-u-r-s-e and maybe that's an idea for you try the circles with the general calisthenics okay so the military application would be the parkour stuff or you know any anything you could put together uh, the next one traditionally was uh, what they call pedagogy, which is learning how the human body works. You could do simple, I, I tell you something that would help them their whole life. If you could look up sprint drills, uh, there's the A, B sprint drills and some of the others. Uh, we used a, a whole system uh, when I was coaching at Judge Memorial, um, teaching them how, working on uh, uh, mechanics of sprinting, work on the mechanics of back and forth. And of course, the third one is, is uh, the third pillar was sports and games. And uh, I don't know. I mean, I, the kids I coached loved Ultimate Frisbee. And then we called it Ultimate Hoover, which was uh, Ultimate Frisbee, but with a four pound medicine ball, the big soft Dynamax ones. Uh, you're going to have to just figure out what's going to be safe. And I, I know it's not going to be wrestling. And I know I don't think it's going to be basketball, but, you, you, you know. Uh, look up, look up uh, some things and see what you can get away with on distance. And the other thing too is, man, it's, maybe it's time to teach everyone to be a cross country runner. Hope that helps. I don't know. Bye bye. We have a question from Andrew. Andrew asks, my question is about the mountain climbing program. I ran through the whole program this past spring, partly because quarantine limited my equipment to what I had available, which oddly worked perfect for the program. And as preparation for trips to the Adirondack high peaks in the early summer. First, I love the program. Thank you very much. It worked really well. And though I try to keep in good shape year round, the trips up and down the high peaks were less fatiguing than in the past. Hey, yeah, good. So to the question, the template of the program seems inclusive. That's an interesting phrase. I know the program itself goes for a limited period of time, but could the template be used year round? For example, replacing the long walks with mountain biking in the summer and ski touring in the winter. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, first off, folks, it's a program I wrote for one of the editors of Men's Health. Uh, in fact, I'm really kind of proud of the program because uh, I love solving problems. That's my favorite thing to do. Uh, I, it really is. I, I like it a lot. And the situation was they, the person was invited to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, in six weeks and they weren't ready and they said help me out so I put together a program that included uh, loaded carries rucking walking uh, basic mobility very simple stuff and some some basic training very simple very doable uh, the focus was an intelligent finish uh, and every single person who's followed the program has come away surprised at how everything just builds up simply on each other and when you're it's maybe, maybe, again it's probably not a perfect program somebody else could do a lot better job but it works really well I've got a lot of great feedback Andrew I've got to tell you um, yeah I think it's a great idea um, you're probably in the winter gonna have to have a, a bit of a mix of things um, you could certainly if you can walk I mean here even in Utah on the worst days we can still get a walk in even though it's, it can be slushy and slippery um so keep you know for the ski touring kind of stuff yeah no problem at all just remember it's a lot easier to walk out your house with a backpack than it is to load up all the gear and go to the place where you can go do the ski tour load up your bike go to the place you can mountain bike unless this is right outside your door uh, so just yeah absolutely I think it's, in fact I, i'm kind of looking forward to you uh keeping tabs on this for me because i think I mean, maybe you've dis discovered something interesting. Uh, maybe some variation in the movements will be appropriate. Uh, at the top of my head, I don't, I don't know what would be a good variation, uh, depending on the equipment you have and what you know. 
but throw in, you know, throw in some additional changes in the weightlifting for sure. Uh, great question and good luck to you, Andrew. We got a question from Sean. I'm not seeking medical advice. Good. But I would like some strength advice. I'm 33 years old, 5'8", 160 uh, pounds, and I've been very active, athletic, and worked blue-collar jobs my whole life. I went through a very standard orthoscopic knee surgery about four years ago and never recovered functionally, mainly due to me returning things too early. Ah, uh, Sean. Sean, you gotta... Yeah, you gotta follow those baby steps. But okay, we're, we're, we're here we're at. So let's go for it. And had some severe quad atrophy after atrophy after the fact. Uh, that is that is the issue. Uh, total hip replacements, total knees, total shoulders. Uh, you really lose some. Uh, you, you you lose muscle. You lose size. You lose. Uh, it's like you got to really retalk to everything again. Um, that's why I'm such a big fan of prowlers after a total hip replacement, because you're practicing your gait. And you're loading it up at the same time, so it's a win-win. Enough on that. Um, it seems intuitive that the barbell back squat would be a staple to my routine. I wouldn't agree with that. And do them twice a week. I also do some kettlebell work, including goblet squats, and try to surround my back squat days with other moves from easy strength. I know it sounds like I'm chasing too many rabbits. Yes, it does. And I probably am, but that's just why I'm reaching out. My question is, is my emphasis on the barbell back squat justified? I know you are a big fan of the deadlift and have stated that the squat can be can have diminishing returns on performance. What would you do differently? Embarrassing, my, embarrassingly, my current best in the back squat is less than my body weight, as is my deadlift. Well, Sean, I mean, it, it, right there, right there is the, the, the answer for you. Let's uh, let's get some big loads there on on the deadlift. I want you to move up to the rack deadlift first. Uh, that's why I want you to put, if you can, I mean, if you have the equipment for it, uh, get the barbell about one inch above the knee and just practice getting from strength there. Um, I want you to kind of monitor how that impacts your knee. Uh, I have never had an issue personally with my knees on rack deadlifts or even deadlifts, but you know, we're, we're kind of digging ourselves out of a hole here. For a while, I'd like to stop the back squat just, just for a while and maybe do three days a week of the goblet squat and get your reps up a little bit. And what, what I'm thinking of is maybe this, it, maybe we need to do some actual rehab with you. Um, if you can, go buy their buck 50, uh, those mini bands, and I want them to put them around your socks, and I want you to walk the monster walks, okay? That's when you walk and you're gonna drive your heels out, and that'll help your hips. Weirdly, it's going to run that all the way, those bands, all the way down to the outside of your knee. Strangest thing I discovered when I started doing those mini band monster walks, my knees felt better. And it took me like a, a couple of months to figure out what was happening. But, you know, uh, as we say in science, you know, uh, the leg bone's connected to the knee bone. Um, I, I would like you to go back and see a physical therapist. I would like you to to get a second opinion, maybe even eyes on it. It could, could be something as simple, um, it could be something as simple as you need to do some kind of variation of a, a leg extension. Um, I'm not a big fan of the leg extension machine, but Sean, what I'm a huge fan is walking backwards up hills. For the, it's the same thing as the, the most important part of the, of the leg extension for the knees. Um, if you don't have hills where you live, and that's common, uh, walking backwards with a sled. If you want to make it harder, you wear a backpack with weights in it or do like we do. Uh, we do farmer bars backwards. Uh, we discovered this at the discus camp in Ohio years ago. Uh, and I really think it had a great impact on our female basketball players. Now, it's, it was a throwing camp, but many of the athletes play multiple sports. And a lot of our female, female athletes have, you know, have some real knee issues, you know, uh, there's kind of a joke because how do you know she has a knee issue? Well, she's a Division One basketball player. Um, walking backwards up hills might be the best rehab I could get you to do. Again, if you don't have hills, do sleds. Let's get some goblet squats in there. Uh, I would suggest keeping the reps high, 10 to 12. That'll build up some hypertrophy along the whole chain. 
Uh, it'll also be easier to get in and out with and monitor your depth and those rack deadlifts. Let's try those three. Uh, let's do those for three to six weeks and then uh, get a look at it, uh, someone else look at it, and then I want you to get back to me. Generally, we don't answer questions from anonymous, but it'll make sense why this time. I'm interested to hear your take on the possibilities of training with or around hemorrhoids. Not the loveliest topic, but one I'm sure I'm not alone in being curious about. I've been affected twice, and I'm very sure both times were related to lifting. The first came from a 20-minute density blocks shouldering a large tree chunk section. A terrible idea. That's really, I don't even understand that. Once you're in the weeds and breathing hard for... Uh, for form suffers and the proper management of intra-abdominal tension goes out the window. This was a thrombosed hemorrhoid. I pray your listeners have no idea what it is and I urge them not to Google it. I think I know what it is and I don't want them to Google it. It's enough to say it's really grim, really painful, and training during those tender times was not an option. The second though, which I sus suspect came from front squatting a sandbag, was totally painless. While I certainly rested, my mind did wander to ways of working around the issue. I thank the Lord for healing me uh, seemingly completely, but also wonder what training might look like should it ever return. I plan on playing the iron, iron game for life, so would love to hear your thoughts. It's interesting, you know, uh, I have this thing in my training system called anaconda strength, which is one of the three parts of training your stone, uh, arrow, anaconda, and armor. Anaconda strength is teaching people to increase that inner pressure, like an inner tube. Uh, in both of your cases, um, in both cases here in Anonymous, uh, it seems like that was part of it. Because if you're front squatting with the sandbag, it's all that internal pressure. So, <laughs> we should at least think about this first before we talk about training with the, the issue. Uh, do you do suit? suitcase carriers because suitcase carriers uh, are the gentlest of the anaconda strength lifts that we do. Bear hug carries will be in the same way. When you do bear hug carries in front squats, uh, you're expecting, uh, you're going to have to put, you're going to put a lot of pressure and then of course you're going to put a lot of pressure down there. So my first recommendation is you to think about an building your anaconda strength just for your long term. It'd be interesting to know what your sports background is and your lifting background uh, before this. But if you're going to be doing the bear hug, uh, the, the sandbag uh, front squats, the, the bear hug squats, uh, if that's an issue, it, 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 as you drop down, you are obviously changing some levels with your, your anaconda strength. So I would say think about some suitcase carry, that's one-handed farmer walks, uh, some more uh, bear hug carries, and I would back off on those bear hug front squats for a while until you really can start to feel yourself pressurizing but not popping out. Training in the future, uh, from what I understand about hemorrhoids, and I'm certainly no expert, uh, uh, there's going to have to be a high level of cleanliness. I understand rest is a big deal. Uh, I just read an article about water and, de and uh, dehydration among Americans. And one of the things they noted is the, the rise of, uh, of hemorrhoids. So uh, make sure uh, you're eating your vegetables, you're eating your fruits, you're drinking your water, okay? Uh, you know, I would also suggest eating some fermented foods uh, to help the, butt gut, uh, the gut biome. My daughters keep saying butt biome, and now I cannot unsay it, thanks kids, uh, with your gut biome. And uh, so, you know, so to build up the floor and fauna down here, uh, the suitcase carries, the bear hug carries to build up the anaconda strength. And then uh, um, just continue on. And when it does come around again, and if it, this, I really would love it if you would see a, a, a good proctologist to see if there is an underlying issue there, um, if it does show up again. I would even make an appointment just to go see one and it, without him and just to be able to talk back and forth. You know, I'm guessing there's going to be some DNA issues you, you genetically. You know, you might be um, 
more this way, but it could also be something really simple that I just don't know about. I hope that helps Anonymous, and uh, now we know the standard for me answering Anonymous questions, so thank you. We have a question from Lisa. Okay, well, this is nice. We've, uh, we haven't had very many Lisa questions, and we get several in the same few weeks. I'm hoping this is the right email for you and would love any help you can offer. I've been stuck at a particular weight, 138, for six months now. I gave up on intermittent fasting, she wrote IF. I've heard a lot of women don't see uh, uh, much of a lot of results. Okay, women and intermittent fasting, uh, it, is kind of, it is a bit of a, a binary thing. It works great or it doesn't. Having said that, when you talk about intermittent fasting, the follow-up question is always, what do you mean by that? Uh, are you fasting 16 hours a day and then having a, a window of eight hours where you eat? Are you having two full fast days a week, the 5-2 system? Uh, there are a number of different kinds of fasting. Um, for me, I'm, a, I'm a more of a 16-8 kind of guy, 15-9. I don't do math. I fast a long time every day. Um, I felt like I was working so hard and not an ounce came off. I was counting calories at first to stay around 1,300 to 1,500, then increased a, a bit thinking it would help. If I work out, I burn around 2,100 calories. But if I can't get a workout in, I'm looking at uh, 1,750 or so. I did this for three months, and if anything, I put on two pounds. I even keto briefly and got nothing. My eating has been pretty clean for a while. I've never had any trouble leaning out. In fact, my testosterone was often high for a woman. You know, it's funny, until I read that, one of the things I was going to rec recommend you do is get a pro blood profile and get your T levels looked at. Um, um, my doctor recommends a fairly high T level for women, uh, much higher than, than most would think. I was an athlete and found it easy to maintain and put on muscle. I can't figure out for the life of me why I can't budge. I was able to maintain my weight for years, about five pounds less than what I am now. I know that doesn't sound like much to a guy, but that little bit makes a huge difference for me. I know you talk about doing stuff that you are inefficient at. I'm not sure what to try. I've lifted for years. I'm not afraid of heavy weights. I did complexes for a while because I was doing a lot of Pat Flynn's workouts during COVID. I had access to weights and was keeping up my major movement patterns good. I haven't lost any strength, but I've put on a good three quarter inch that makes my clothes feel a little bit snug. Help, how can I get out of this rut? I was listening to some recommendations you made. Today I did three by three presses, pull-ups, deadlifts, one by 10 ab roller and 75 swings. Then I did the 40 minute walking, trying to get my heart rate between 125 to 145. Finally, her age comes in, she's 35. I had a 25 pound backpack on and could get my heart rate to 125. I need to run to start hitting those numbers. That should be a question mark right there. Am I supposed to run 40 minutes after my workouts? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, first thing, you're 35. Good news and bad news. The good news is you're 35. And I'm 63, so you still got a lot of life ahead of you. Bad thing, in the mid-30s, man, uh, your body just starts to want to get uh, less than lean. It just does, man. So I like the fact that you're trying easy strength. Now, if you're doing the easy strength for fat loss program, which I just saw you there, uh, one of the things you're supposed to come into that fasted when you do the workouts and then uh, keep your heart rate up. I think you're making a quantitative error right here. You're putting 25 pounds up here, which is great, but the only problem is 25 pounds here is fairly efficient. I would suggest you trying the hand weights. We do the, we call them heavy hands. I, I only need three pounds in each hand, but I tell you, if you use fives, it's a game changer, and walk and swing those arms. What I'd like you to do is go, for, if you don't have them, go out and purchase a couple of three and a couple of five pound dumbbells I also have eights and tens, and I tell you that tens are brutal. Um, and the next time you go walking, get your heart rate monitor on, and just after you do your easy strength, 
pump those arms with the five pound weights and see where heart rate goes. I have five pound weights on both ankles and then I have three pounds in my hands. And that's enough for me at my age, uh, at, uh, at 63, to keep my heart rate in the Maffetone zones. I, I know you eat clean. I know you do intermittent fasting. You're, you're doing a lot of stuff. I think you're doing a lot of the correct stuff. Uh, ha having said all that, there's one other thing you don't really talk about. Listen, we're in the middle of the COVID pandemic. Uh, here in the West, everything's on fire. In the East, we have hurricanes. Um, those, every time you turn on the news, there's a lot of bad news. It's, it's not a good time. People saying terrible things about each other. and We're, we're in a, a lot's going on. I don't know what your, your family life is like. I don't know or married, kids, whatever. But we know that stress is a factor in keeping, uh, well, our body reacts to stress with inflammation and, I think, f fat storage. You're at 35 where the, 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 the rules change. You're in 2020 where the, one of the craziest years of my life, I, I put this with 1968. And for those of us who are cognizant in 68, that's a high standard of crazy. Um, so I would also like you to think about your stress levels. Uh, and I don't want to add any stress to you. If you do easy strength for fat loss, you add the heavy hands, you get your numbers up, and you do the fast, and you eat clean, get those veggies in, you know, get the fermented foods in. Um, as it says, states in the program. Uh, let's... Let's go, and let's just see how that works. I would like you to have some stress breaks in your day. I'd like to have you do some meditation. I'd like you to deal with stress the best you can. Now, I know you didn't mention it, but I, I just think it's got to be a factor. So uh, let's get back to this, and uh, let me know how it goes with the heavy hands and the basic program. Okay? Thank you for your question. Well, thanks again, everybody. If you have questions, remember, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer every question. Remember, too, we have a big archive now. You can go there at podcast at the Dan John University site or check my YouTube for all the, all the past ones, okay? Thanks so much. We'll see you again soon.